<coughs> Thanks a lot for the nice introduction, um, Holger. So I'm going to talk about Apache Flink today. Um, my name is Robert Metzger. I am a committer and PMC member of the Apache Flink project. Um, I'm also working at Data Artisans here in Berlin, a company that has been founded by um, some of the creators um, of Apache Flink. Um, and today's talk is going to introduce you to Apache Flink. Um, but I would like to start first with my take on the stream processing space, so why I think that streaming is a really big thing. So if you look at the program of this conference, you also saw that a lot of talks are about streaming. Um, I'm giving my personal view why I think that streaming is such a big thing. Um, then I will do a little introduction to Flink. Um, and then I will take one very common batch use case um, and review how we can transform this batch use case into a streaming use case to show you um, how you can run existing batch workloads with a streaming engine um, and also um, what new use cases or new um, business values uh, you can get out of um, a streaming system. And after that, um, I will do a little demo where I showcase um, the streaming ETL job um, and, and how to get started and use Flink. Um, so Apache Flink is an open source uh, stream processing framework. Um, while building the engine, we are focusing on low latency and high throughput. Um, we are also focusing on stateful stream processing, which means that um, unlike first generation stream processors, um, the system is aware of what you're doing within your code. So um, when you, for example, have a variable that is counting the number of events or you have a hash map um, where all your um, data is contained, you can tell Flink, look, this is my data, please take care of it, um, make backups and so on. Um, this gives you a lot of advantages over other systems. Um, and of course, it's a distributed system similar to all the other big data frameworks. It runs on commodity hardware. Um, and as the name suggests, um, it's developed in the Apache Software Foundation. In March, we released the 1.0 version, um, and the community is currently discussing and working towards the 1.1 release of Flink. Um, Stefan yesterday presented, for example, Query State, which might be a new feature that is in the 1.1 version. Um, Flink is used widely in production. I think some of our users um, present here at Buzzwords, um, and you can find blog posts and so on describing what they are doing with Flink. Um, so what about this whole uh, streaming bus that everybody is talking about? Um, in my opinion, streaming is the biggest change in the data infrastructure since Hadoop for multiple reasons. So number one, um, it radically simplifies your infrastructure. So you need fewer systems, you don't need to build a fancy um, Lambda architecture to cover your batch and your real-time streaming workloads. You can do everything in one system. Um, you can do, your with, you can do um, more with your data and you can do it faster. So um, by having this low latency engine that can do batch processing and stream processing at the same time, you can cover your existing use cases and you can add new ones um, as well. And yeah, you can com completely subsume batch. You can get rid of the whole, of a lot of batch pipelines. And you might wonder now, how is this possible? Am I not a bit over-promising here? But the reason is why, I'm, why I can confidently say that I really believe that uh, streaming systems are a really big thing is that um, if you look at the way data is produced in the real world, you will see that data is actually produced in a continuous fashion. So if you have, for example, a web server running somewhere, um, in, in the batch world, you basically have the web server and then you have local log files. So every, every, time, every time somebody clicks somewhere, an entry is written to the uh, Apache server web log. And then you have like a MapReduce job or so, or Flume, which is pulling the data from uh, the web servers into HDFS, and then you have another job which is pulling the data from HDFS into Cassandra or whatever. Um, that's the traditional way of processing data with a batch system. However, the data is actually produced in a real-time fashion. So every time somebody is clicking somewhere, a new event is generated. And new systems like Flink and Kafka embrace this nature. So 
instead of storing the file first on the web server, then in HDFS, and then to the Cassandra or whatever database, um, you can just stream the events from the web server immediately to Kafka, and then the stream processor can pick up the data from Kafka and process it from there. So real-world data is produced continuously, and we just need to con continuously process it, process it as well. Um, and to do that, I'm suggesting to use Apache Flink. Um, and this is the Apache Flink stack. So when you're downloading Flink from our website, you're getting this entire stack. Um, and the core of the stack is this streaming data flow runtime. It's an engine that allows you to um, execute um, data flow graphs in a distributed system. And for starting this engine, there are different options. There's the YARN deployment option. There's the standalone cluster mode um, that some of our users are also using for deploying Flink on uh, Docker. And there's the local mode. The local mode allows you to start Flink from within your IDE um, or on your laptop, um, which allows you to set breakpoints, debug, um, and try out the code that will run on the cluster later, also locally. Um, and the, the interesting observation about this engine is that it doesn't really know, it's not really aware of the, the source of the application that it's executing. So <clears throat> whether the program has been implemented in the data stream API or the data set API for batch doesn't really matter for the engine. So there is like an abstraction between these APIs and the engine. Um, and for the data set, for the batch programs, there's an optimizer which is generating a graph for the engine. But since this is a streaming talk, I will only focus on the streaming side of our APIs. So the data stream API is a very nice, easy to use API that feels very natural for Java programmers. Um, and it's the, the most commonly used API for, for writing streaming programs. It's very similar to high level APIs known from the batch world. So it's really easy to get started with Flink. Um, and on top, we've built some use case specific APIs and abstractions. So for example, we have a CEP library for complex event processing, um, which allows you to detect event patterns in your stream. So if you're doing some, I don't know, fraud analysis uh, or behavior detection or so, you can use the CEP en uh, engine, um, which can do pattern matching. Um, an upcoming feature in 1.1 is Stream SQL, which allows you to um, define SQL statements on streams. So this will allow users, or even more users, to, to enter the streaming space. Um, then there's Apache Beam, another Apache project currently undergoing incubation. It has been contributed to Apache from Google. Um, and Beam is basically um, one API for different engines um, in the open source world, and also on Google's cloud engine. Um, and Flink has one of the most sophisticated runners for this Beam API. So currently Spark and Flink are supported. Um, and there's this compatibility matrix on their website where you can see which features are supported by which eng uh, engine. But the cool thing about Beam is you can implement your stuff in one API and run it with different engines. Um, and there are other um, layers like the Storm API that allows you to run existing Storm jobs on Flink. And there's Apache Samoa, which allows you to, uh, to do machine learning on streams. Um, maybe a different way of looking at Flink is um, looking at its um, features. So I've created four categories. Um, number one is true streaming. So it's a real streaming engine that is focusing on high throughput and low latency. So by having this engine that can deploy these data flow graphs, which are continuously running and immediately pushing data forward as it enters the system, um, we can process the data really quick um, and fast. Um, and also the, this engine has very well behaved behavior when it comes to flow control. So the system naturally behaves um, under, under load situations. Um, it can slow down um, upstream operators if operators are not fast enough for processing the data. Um, then the engine has support for event time which allows you, which basically makes the system aware of the time when the event happened in reality. And this way we can reprocess historic data and we are not 
um, the system is not suffering from network failures or out of, clock, uh, out of um, order clocks. I will explain later how exactly the event time is working. But it's a really crucial feature um, for, for a streaming engine. Um, the APIs and libraries, as I said, are very rich. For example, you can do the complex event processing. And we have very um, flexible um, window API that allows you to define windows on time, on the number of elements. You can also build session windows that allow you to um, detect basically user sessions. So for example, um, a user session when somebody is clicking on web servers. So Flink allows you to detect that some events belong to the same user and then you can do analysis on that session. Um, and Flink allows you to do stateful stream processing. So <clears throat> the system can be made aware of the, the state, um, the variables that you're using within your application code. And with this, we can um, provide exactly once guarantees for um, fault tolerance. So when something is failing, we can restore your state. Um, the internal windows of Flink are also using the, the registered state of Flink. So we are also taking care of the window contents, so they are not lost in case of a failure. And we have these safe points that allow you to um, create globally consistent checkpoints um, of your state. This way you can take a snapshot of your state, store it in HDFS, and then, for example, deploy a new version of your job or upgrade your Flink version or do some cluster maintenance. And then you can restore your job from that specific um, safe point. So let's move an existing um, data analysis job into the streaming world. Um, one very common use case is ETL, extract, transform, load. Um, I've looked a bit for a definition uh, for ETL and I found many. That's why I came up with my own. So I added one, added one more. And my definition is just move data from A to B and transform it on the way. Um, so the old approach for ETL um, works like this. You have some data sources, for example, server logs or machine data, um, mobile or IoT, some sensors and so on. Um, and then you're ingesting this data into one common raw data store. Some Hadoop vendors call this the data lake. Um, where you just put your raw data and you'll figure out later on what to do with the data. Um, then you have some periodic jobs um, which read the data from this data lake, normalize it, clean it, and then put it into some system like Elasticsearch or into Parquet or RC, uh, columnar file format for later analysis. Uh, for example, with Impala or Hive and so on. And then the last step is to do aggregations on the data. For example, if you're doing a website or so and you want to see the, the user behavior. Again, you're using periodic batch jobs and ingest the data um, into these data stores like Cassandra, Redis, or MySQL. Um, so <clears throat> how can we move such um, a batch architecture into the streaming world? So instead of using HDFS, we're using Apache Kafka for, the, for storing the raw data. So all these data sources are just sending their stuff into Kafka, and we figure out later on what exactly to do with it. Then we are using a stream processor. Um, Apache Flink has, for example, a connector for Apache Kafka, which is also exactly once for the consumer. So in case of a failure in Flink, we can just restore and nothing is lost and everything is in sync. Then within Flink, um, I've put like a generic data cleansing task here, um, which is removing invalid records and so on. Um, and then some of the data goes to a transformation and alert generation. And the output of this data could, for example, go to Elasticsearch again and to um, a rolling file sync. So the rolling file sync is for example, creating a new directory every minute where the system is putting data into. Um, yeah, and the, the other part of the clean data is going into time windows to do some um, real-time aggregations. So we have, for example, a JDBC sync or a Cassandra sync. Um, 
that allows you to send data from Flink um, into these other systems. Um, so you see that the, the architecture is already a bit simplified because you have this one system here in the middle that is taking care of the clean data and the aggregated data, and that is also taking care of consistency. So <clears throat> the, as I said, the, Cassandra, uh, the Kafka connector um, is taking part of Flink's snapshotting, so it's exactly once. Um, and for example, our Cassandra sync is also providing um, exactly one semantics for item potent updates. So the data is always in sync. Um, another advantage of this architecture is that you're reducing the latency um, drastically. Um, so the events are processed immediately as they arrive, as they enter into this architecture, into the system. In the previous architecture, you saw that I had these two loading jobs between the stages, that we are loading the data from the web servers, IoT data, into um, HFS, and then this other job, which is um, creating the aggregated data. In this case, data is processed as it enters the system. It can immediately walk into, I don't know, Elasticsearch or the file system. So the latency goes down drastically. Um, so if, you, if you're comparing the different approaches that exist in the space, um, this periodic batch job approach is in the range of hours. Maybe some users, if they're using fancy hardware, they can get down to minutes with a batch system, but it's pretty expensive um, and tedious to, to run such an infrastructure because you have to keep all your batch jobs running all the time. Um, it's complicated. Then, um, for example, Apache Spark has this um, batch processor with micro-batches built in. So basically, it's just a logical um, development from this periodic batch shop that is triggered by a workflow manager um, to this triggering into the, stream, into the batch processor itself. So Spark itself um, or other systems that are using micro-batches um, they just trigger batches continuously, and from the outside, it looks like a stream processor. With that approach, you can get down to seconds, um, but only with a stream processor, you can really get into this milliseconds um, latency area. Um, you see these little stars here? So your mileage may vary. Um, don't believe my numbers. Believe your own numbers. Um, I can say this with confidence, because Flink is really easy to use. So in half a day, you should be able to do a little proof of concept um, and try it out, out yourself on your own hardware with your own requirements and so on. And then you can do your own measurements and see what the latency is that you get for your use case. Um, so please don't trust numbers. Try it out yourself. Another advantage, advantage is this um, event time awareness. So <clears throat> the events that we are processing um, they might arrive out of order in the system. So if you're looking in this, uh, at this architecture again, you have these three different sources, and these three different sources might have different clocks. Um, so imagine, for example, we have this mobile phone, um, and somebody with a mobile phone is walking into a factory. So the factory Wi-Fi recognizes, okay, somebody entered the factory. Then... This Wi-Fi recognizes, okay, he's in a factory. An app on the, wi on the mobile is sending a message to the web server. So these blue events here are all related to the same real-world event. However, the clock of the mobile is off. So the Wi-Fi clock says at 11.28 the person entered the factory. The app set says close to 11.29 I got this event. So the, the clocks are out of sync. Another issue is network delay, network delay. So maybe the network of the factory uh, is delayed or not working all the time. So it might happen that events arrive much later in Kafka than events from the web server or from the mobile phone. Another issue is machine failures. It could happen that, for example, the machines at Flink or in Kafka or somewhere else are failing. And this way, we are not processing data for, for a short period of time. With a stream processor that is event time aware, we can basically <clears throat> tell the system to use the time when the event happened in reality and not the time when the event arrived in the system. And this way you can do stuff like reprocessing 
Um, and you always get correct results, uh, also in case of failures. So let's turn this into reality. Um, so I've prepared a little demo that is also doing this streaming ETL. So <clears throat> I've created two jobs, one very small job. So this small job um, is, so this says, uh, what does it say? Flink Twitter source. So in Flink, there is a Twitter source, source which is reading data from Twitter um, into Kafka. And then there is a second job, the streaming ETL job, um, which is reading the data from Kafka into this job. So let's have a look at what the job is doing. So this is the topology. Here is the Kafka source, which is reading the data from Kafka. Here is a filter operation, which is filtering all the records that are system data. So in, from this um, Twitter data source, you're getting tweets, and you're also getting some system data from, from uh, Twitter. And with this filter, I'm just removing all the system data to get the tweets only. And then it's splitting up into three different flows. The first flow is a rolling file sync. Here I'm filtering for all the tweets which are English. So I'm filtering on the field lang language equals English. And then I'm writing this to a rolling file sync. So in the cluster you would use HGFS or Amazon S3. Um, or you can also use a local file system like I do in my demo. The second flow is doing a window aggregation. So I'm counting the language of the tweets in 10 second tumbling windows. So I'm collecting tweets for 10 seconds, then I'm looking at their language, um, and I'm counting each of, it, each of the languages. And then I'm sending the result after 10 seconds into Elasticsearch. That's a tumbling window, which is always collecting for 10 seconds, then pushing the result, and then it's collecting for another 10 seconds. Um, and the last job here, or the last part of this job, is doing a streaming word count. So I'm extracting only the text field from the tweet um, to get just a string, not this full JSON with all the user data, location, and so on from Twitter. Then I'm tokenizing the words, so I'm taking this whole text string and splitting it to, to individual words um, into a tuple two. So word comma one is just a classical word count you know from MapReduce. So this is basically the mappers, and this is the reducer. In this case, since we're on a stream, we cannot really reduce because we would basically collect data forever. Um, that's why I'm using a one minute time window for collecting the frequencies of the word. So there's a window standing open for one minute and collecting um, all the words and their counts. And every 10 seconds, I'm evaluating this window. So it's basically a sliding window. Every 10 seconds, it's sliding forward, but it's always of size 10. And this way, this operator is emitting every 10 seconds um, the frequencies of the words in the tweets of the last minute. Then there's a top end window, which is just sorting the frequency um, so that I can get like the top 10 tweets um, of the last minute. And then I'm writing this to Kafka. So that's the job that I'm going to present you now. Um, you can see my screen. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to the um, consume tweet word count topic in Kafka. So as I said, I'm writing the data to Kafka. And this topic is um, reading the events from Kafka, um, uh, reading these top n events from Kafka. All right, the next step is to um, start Flink. So when you download Flink, you get basically, can you see the screen? It's probably a bit too small. <laughs> um, yeah. I try to increase the font size a bit. Okay, so I'm doing bin. Um, so now I've started Flink, and once you've started Flink on localhost 8081, you can see the web interface, the web dashboard of Flink. Um, so right now you see that there's one task manager connected, it has one processing slots, uh, and they are all available. Um, and 
Yeah, one more thing. So as I said, um, you can do batch and stream processing with the same engine. And what I'm going to do now is I'm basically going to do batch processing only with the streaming engine. Because I have a Kafka topic, as, as I've showed you on the slides, <clears throat> with the tweets. And this Kafka topic contains, um, <clears throat> I think, 500 megabytes of old tweets from a few days ago. So I'm now just reading all the old, tweet, old tweets from Kafka. Um, and the interesting thing is that due to this event time, I will still get counts on the top end window. Because I'm using event time, it will still, for the historic data, create correct windows um, with the counts. So um, let me start the streaming ETL job. Um, So now you see here that the job is running. So you see this topology that I showed you earlier. You see that here the operators are um, processing data. So it's processed 40,000 records already, 59, um, and counting. And here you're seeing, ah, it's not very well visible. So here you're seeing all the top n counts um, for the tweets. So you see here the, the time. So it's currently at June 1st. Now it's at June 2nd. Um, and the top n for the top 10 um, words from the word count um, written into Kafka, into this um, word count topic in Kafka. Um, yeah, Maybe I can increase the font size even further so that you can see it. Um, so can you now see it? So, <clears throat> so now we are at June 6, 1524. So that is probably the last time um, when I tried out this demo. Um, and you see that the most frequent word is retweet. <laughs> um, then it's probably new line, a, the, um, and so on. So I didn't do any stop word filtering or so. I just took the raw data. OK, so now it stopped doing anything because there's no new data being written into Kafka. So what I will do now is I start a little job um, called Twitter into Kafka. So it's connecting to Twitter. Um, I'll, let me open um, another terminal. So this is called consume tweets. It's um, just the listening on the Kafka topic where I'm going to write the tweets. So I'm now starting this job. Um, I'm just starting it from the IDE. Um, and now you should see, yeah, so now all the tweets are showing up in this. So this is just the tweets that I'm getting from Twitter that I'm writing into Kafka. And um, I think in one minute we will start seeing um, the word count uh, for the top n of these tweets that I'm currently collecting um, from Twitter. The reason why there is a delay is because I'm using watermarks. So Flink has this built-in watermark system for um, handling late arrivals. <clears throat> so as I explained, we have these events that arrive out of order. Um, so the, the question for the windows in Flink is always, um, OK, it's starting. <laughs> Um, so now we saw June 7th, 1126. Um, so it is now. Apparently, you have 10 minutes left. Um, so now it's uh, slowly starting to write the, the top N. Um, apparently, I'm getting some, I don't know, Arab tweets. So I'm just, it's not the full stream of Twitter. It's just uh, a sample of the, of the tweets from them. Um, so yeah. So now you see it's, um, it's starting to write events to the top N. Um, and you also see in the web interface um, that it's processing data in real time um, as events come from the, from the Twitter source. Um, also, I've created a little, I'm really not an expert in Kibana, um, Kibana dashboard um, where you can see the um, where you can see the data. So <clears throat> here you can see the distribution of the languages. So English is, of course, the, 
So this says English. So this is, of course, the most frequent language. Um, and you also see the, um, the counts of the languages. So this is produced um, by this part of the, of the streaming flow. So we've looked at this one. So here's the Kafka sync, which is writing the top N to Kafka. This is the aggregation to Elasticsearch. So there we have this 10 second window, which is counting the frequency of the languages and writing it to Elasticsearch. And this is the rolling file sync. So we can also take a look into um, the rolling file sync. Um, so it's located. Um, so here the rolling sync. And here you see um, that for every minute, we are creating a new directory. Um, so I can go into the 28, for example. Um, and then there is a file. It's three megabytes. Um, and there you see all the raw. This is where the signs are coming from. Yeah. So here you see the raw um, tweets written to a file. Um, so this way you can see that there are different um, data syncs where this one source is writing different kinds of data to different ends. Um, all right. So <clears throat> let me close with a talk. So if you like this stuff, if you would like to do more stuff like this, I've had a virtual machine running at Google Cloud for the last seven days where I was collecting Twitter data. So I have like 100 gigabytes of Twitter stream data. And tomorrow we will organize a Flink hackathon, um, which is in, uh, at the Telekom building at Wittenberg. Uh, yeah, it's in close to Kreuzberg, uh, not at Wittenbergplatz. Um, so you can still sign up. I've asked. There are 10 spots left. So if you're interested in working with Flink, um, you can do a self-paced um, workshop. You can work with the data that I collected. We have also other data sources. Or you can do your own stuff. Um, some of the Flink committers will be there to help you. So this is a great opportunity to, to learn more about Flink. It's also free. Um, and if you like this location, and if you would like to learn more about Flink, there's um, Flink Forward uh, in September in Berlin. Um, the, um, so you can still submit talks for the conference, and you can still get tickets for the early bird rate. Um, so this is going to be a great conference. Last year was also very good. Um, and yeah, my employer is currently hiring, so if you're interested in working uh, with open source projects, then please talk to me. Um, and now's the time for you to ask questions. Um, you can also send me an email, follow me on Twitter, follow the Apache Flink project on Twitter. We have the mailing lists um, known from other Apache projects, and we have two very good blogs where you can read about the latest features and developments of Flink. So are there any questions? Thank you. Um, yes? I can also repeat the question. Can you, you can also say the question and repeat yeah, so, it. Okay. So I'm kind of new in the streaming world, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of wrapping my head around it. So for example, in the... <coughs> Hello? Can I have it? Oh. <laughs> so, so in the top right corner, when you like do the aggregates in one minute windows, mm -hmm. how do you then, then consolidate all that on the larger scale? What's the like a year? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, the question is, how do you do windows that are larger than 10 seconds or one minute? How do you consolidate the whole day at the, at, at the end, like to get like a month? Ah, um, so, so let, me, let me first answer like one part of the question. So Flink supports, so the windows are using this internal um, state backends of Flink. So they allow you to store state um, on the local file system in, um, in RocksDB. So we're using RocksDB as a state backend, um, which is like a um, key value store on the hard disk. And this way, we, we are not limited to the, the heap size. We can use 
basically infinite amount or the amount of hard disk space available for keeping window contents um, around. So you can build windows multi-month or whatever, depending on the amount of data that you're having. And then um, there are different ways of getting data from the window. So there's, uh, you can basically get an iterator over all the events in the window, um, and then you can do whatever analysis you want. Um, and there are also aggregated windows where you, for example, specify that you want to do um, just a count. And in this case, you're not keeping all the data, we're just keeping the counts for each key. And this way, the, the space requirements are much lower because you only need to store one value per key and not all the data for multiple months. Yeah. But what you're actually doing with the data in the window depends on you. So you can specify the size of your window. You can also specify windows on number of events. You can also say just the last 1,000 events or 2 million events. And then you get an iterator over the events and then you can do your analysis and emit the outcome of the window. So this is just an outcome of one window. Uh, consider the following use case where you receive a file on HDFS every five seconds. Mm -hmm. Let's say one gigabyte file mm -hmm. every five seconds. And then you need to make some transformations, some aggregations, joints with data from Hive, and some transformation on that data, mm -hmm. the incoming data. And the output is Elasticsearch or Hive. Mm -hmm. What would be the advantages to use Flink over uh, Spark Streaming, for example? Um, so in Flink, we will soon have a new um, like streaming file source. So in Flink 1.1, so there currently is also a file source, but the new one will also be integrated with the checkpointing. Um, so you can just tell Flink, look, this is a directory, watch it, and every time something new appears in this directory, it will be ingested immediately um, into the streaming engine. And then you can submit it to um, Elasticsearch, do aggregations, write it, and so on, basically what I presented. Um, so there is support for watching a directory and collecting events from the directory. Um, and yeah, the difference between Flink and Spark streaming is basically what I had also in my presentation, that um, Flink is like a real streaming engine. So it um, supports low latency, um, it has support for event time, um, it has these more sophisticated window constructs, you can also build custom windows with it. Um, the, the thing about this micro-batching approach is that you always have latency. You're basically guaranteed that you have latency because of this scheduling time. So you redeploy a batch shop every five seconds or so, so your latency is guaranteed to be at least five seconds. Um, and also, for example, if you have a connection to Elasticsearch or some JDBC or so, you need to re-establish this connection every five seconds because every five seconds you're redeploying another job. Um, and also, it doesn't feel natural to... As an application developer, you always have to be aware that my job is redeployed every five seconds. I have to re-establish a connection to Elasticsearch every five seconds. In, in Flink, it just feels much more natural to have this operator and you know it's running all the time. Um, so it's just a more natural way of, of processing data. There was another question. Can you explain more how you deal with out-of-order items? And yeah. Um, so how do we deal with out-of-order events? Um, <clears throat> so basically what we are doing is, in Flink there is, um, so in this, in this topology here, um, uh, damn, how can I scroll? So here, there is an operator called timestamp extractor. So here we are just getting some JSON from uh, Kafka, and here there is a timestamp extractor, which is um, extracting a long from the JSON data. And this long is the time of the event in reality. So it's not the time when the event arrived in the system, because that can be out of order due to various reasons. Um, and we are using this long field and putting it to the record. So the system has um, to each record, there's a special internal field with a long representing the time of the event. Okay? So this way, operators are aware of that time. So for example, this tumbling um, per language count window, which is doing a window per 10 seconds, um, is using this timestamp field for determining the, the 10 seconds. So it just looks at this field and then puts it to the right window. 
So it can happen that we have multiple windows open. Because, I don't know, maybe for... So because events are arriving out of order, we have to basically start different windows um, par parallel. And as soon as a watermark arrives, so from time to time, this timestamp extractor is sending a watermark. And this watermark says, I guarantee that there will be no later event after this watermark. And once the watermark arrives the window, it knows, OK, I've received all the events that belong to this time window. And then I'm triggering the window, and I'm doing the evaluation and sending the results out to Elasticsearch. So we're using watermarks and this event time field um, for the time. How do you configure the watermarks? Um, yeah, so that's up to the user. So the thing is, the watermarks, um, it really depends on your use case. Um, so <clears throat> what Flink provides by default is, for example, uh, a watermark extractor, which is just looking at the highest um, timestamp seen so far and then subtracting a certain amount of time. So basically, this says, I'm accepting uh, lateness of the events up to one minute. So then you have to basically wait one minute until you get the results. But um, it can still happen that events arrive after, these ten, uh, after this one minute. And then you have to do some custom handling um, of these events. But this is just reality. I mean, the stream processor cannot change reality. Events arrive out of order in the system. We're just providing the tools for the user to, to cope with that. But there's very nice documentation in Flink with nice pictures and so on, showing how this exactly works with the different operators and the low watermarks, how they propagate and so on. Because you always need to use the lowest watermark from all incoming streams. So, uh, also connected to this question, mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about the event time, mm -hmm. uh, you you uh, shown this example before, when, your, when the clocks on your client devices are not in sync, mm -hmm. and you assume this is the event time, that also means uh, you might not get the real order because the field you described is sent by the client who's... Yeah. There might be not only a network delay, but clocks out of sync. Yeah. So you're only providing infrastructure for a problem that exists and not a new solution to the problem itself. Yeah, the thing is, the advantage is that the system is aware of event time. So in Storm and also in these traditional batch approaches, so if you're back then, like in my talk, uh, like ETL with a batch system, there there is no infrastructure at all for treating this time issue. But there's no, no new solution to the problem itself. It's just yes. you don't have to implement Ex it by yourself. Exactly. We just provide infrastructure for the user to uh, handle this problem. And it's quite easy because we have standard tools for this. Our, windowing, our windows um, uh, are aware of this. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, it's not a magic solution <laughs> for this problem. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs>